There is new bombshell reporting about Florida Republican Congressman and Trump acolyte Matt Gates. The two Bureau of Prisons workers tasked with guarding Jeffrey Epstein have admitted that they falsified records. A docu-series on Ghislaine Maxwell, the former girlfriend and alleged accomplice of Jeffrey Epstein, is coming to Discovery Plus. Hello and welcome to The Nexus. Today we're focusing on three scandals out of America that are somewhat connected and simply beggar belief. First up, the perplexing story of Matt Gates, the telegenic congressman from Florida who was touted as the future of the Republican Party, is facing accusations of sex trafficking. Also ahead, the prison guards who are supposed to be watching Jeffrey Epstein on the night he killed himself admit falsifying their work records. And finally, we'll have a quick update on Ghislaine Maxwell, Epstein's former girlfriend, who is to be the subject of a new docuseries, Chasing Ghislaine, a follow-up from last year's hugely successful Netflix series, Filthy Rich. So let's begin with Matt Gates. He's got the hair and teeth of a classic American politician. He was a big supporter of President Donald Trump. He was supposed to go all the way to the top. But the 39-year-old lawyer and congressman now finds himself drowning in a deluge of lurid accusations. America is in a sense of great renewal. We've got a comeback president running against the throwback left. I don't want that for our great We president. want it. That's Thanks, actually... Matt. Good line. Gates. 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 Matt Gates. Matt Gates. Matt Gates. The Florida Republican congressman is one of the most bombastic members of the House of Representatives. Who in the hell do the you gentlemen are? Actual fires and we time. Excuse me, so you don't get to interrupt me on this time. We just got some breaking news. Republican Florida Congressman Matt Gates is under investigation over claims of a quote sexual relationship with a 17-year-old paying for her to travel with him, end quote. Gates denies all allegations. He has not been charged with any crimes. I have not had a relationship with a 17-year-old. That is totally false. Let's start where I think the story starts. This inquiry apparently all stems from a previous investigation into a guy in Florida um, who was, let's see, his name is Mr. Greenberg. Greenberg is a longtime buddy of Gates, and he's already in federal custody for sex trafficking and other crimes. So Greenberg gets investigated for these um, sex trafficking allegations, and that's when they appear to find something untoward about Gates, allegedly. Joel Greenberg is accepting a deal with prosecutors and pleading guilty to multiple federal charges, including child sex trafficking. And it looks like his so-called wingman is getting ready to sing, man. Greenberg admits to being involved in sugar daddy relationships where he paid women for sex, including a minor that he introduced to other adult men who engaged in commercial sex acts. Does my client have information that could uh, hurt uh, an elected official? I guess this is just, you know, must-see television. You'll just have to wait and see. Uh-oh, Gates is screwed. It looks like it is going to get worse for Gates, not better. I'm not going anywhere. Well, what an incredibly bizarre story, which many of the U.S. networks are struggling to unpack. Let's uh, have a go at it ourselves. We have two good guests with us today. We've got uh, Shan Wu, who is a former federal prosecutor in Washington, D.C., and Matt Dixon is Politico's bureau chief in Florida. He's been covering Matt Gates since he became a politician back in 2010. Uh, welcome to both of you. Matt, let's start in Florida and find out a bit about Matt Gates, the man. Um, from all the reports we're seeing in the media, he's got all the hair, he's got the teeth, he's uh, quite a wealthy, from quite a wealthy family, a bit of a frat boy. Is that, is that your impression of him? Yeah, I mean, the, beyond the, uh, the the requisite hair and teeth that you need to become a, a prominent politician, uh, he, he comes from sort of a... He, he's a scion of a political royal family here in, in Florida. Uh, his father used to be the presiding officer in the Florida the State Senate, uh, and the Gates family is, is quite wealthy. So he kind of went into the family business, and by family business, I mean politics. Yeah. Um, he spent spent eight years in, in the Florida House of Representatives, not not Congress, but the, the state-level House of Representatives, and he made a... a 
pretty big name for himself. He was kind of known as a, a smart operator. He, he was in a, a, a leadership position within that legislative body, and he really made a name for himself before going to Congress. And when he went to Congress, he, he really used sort of his, his flamboyant style, and he, he very, you know, he's well-spoken, quick on his feet, and mm. he, he sort of went into the conservative or center-right media ecosystem and really used some of, you know, the, those talents he has to, to expand his his national reputation and international reputation. And then he became known as, as President Trump's sort of chief defender in Congress. He was the congressman that anytime Trump was attacked on on Russia or anything else, he would dispatch Matt Gates to the, the conservative media outlets and he would sort of be the, <laughs> the, the chief defender. The, the, you know, yes. and, and that's really, really where his, his star rose. That's right. It was either him or Jim Jordan, people like that who came out and bombastically defended the president. Now, he ran in 2015 uh, for to be a, a congressman from Florida. Um, is it true that he was primarily bankrolled by his family? Yeah, there was... I, I forget the exact percentages or the, or the exact amount of money, but, yes, there, there was certainly some some help from his father. Uh, his, his dad was, uh, before getting into politics, worked in the, the healthcare sphere and, and has done quite well for himself. His father was actually the, the wealthiest member of the Florida legislature for quite some time. So the, the specific dollar amount, uh, I, I don't right. quite recall. But, yeah, there was certainly some 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 family support, both financially and, and politically. Um, the family is a, a fairly big deal in the, the conservative district that, that Matt Gates ran in. And some people were touting him as the future of the Republican Party, the heir to Donald Trump. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think without question. Uh, it, it wasn't a necessarily a universal position, but those who... Donald Trump voters really like Matt Gates and, and still do. Um, mm. He's actually touring the country right now, even as he's under investigation and getting large crowds. Sure. So those who wanted to see the Republican Party of Florida sort of follow in the, the footsteps of Donald Trump and not sort of reset to what we've historically known here is, is the Republican Party of Florida, they saw Matt Gates as a, as a vehicle for that and someone who he spoke the language, he understood that segment of, of the electorate here. And I think a lot of people saw him as, a, as, as and, really a, a viable candidate moving forward in that he, regard. He didn't, he didn't always pick his friends very wisely by the sounds of it. Tell us about his so-called wingman, Joel Greenberg, and why his association um, has, has landed him in trouble. Well, Joel Greenberg is it would, otherwise would have been a relatively sort of sleepy politician. He's a, a tax collector in a, in a county just outside of Orlando in the central part of state. His, the counties here have elect tax collectors. So generally, right. those are positions that don't get a lot of attention. But uh, this tax collector happened to be very good friends with a, a nationally known congressman. He and, he and Matt Gates were, were very close. Uh, you know, court papers sort of back that up. And there was just a general anecdotal understanding that, that the two were friends. And then uh, it, the, the, the sort of friendship and, and this whole thing started to kind of unravel uh, when, when Joel Greenberg initially got arrested last year. Uh, that was tied to some public corruption-related charges. But then the, the sort of broader net, the wider federal investigation started to come across um, sex trafficking-related allegations and, and allegations now tethered to the, the congressman. And again, just allegations. There right. are no charges against Matt Gates yet. But the, the broader broader scope of that investigation into Joel Greenberg, this sort of sleepy Central Florida bureaucrat, snagged this nationally known congressman. And now there are, are you know, uh, an investigation into whether Matt Gates has hit All right. the 17 year old. And that's kind of where we are today Let's... and how this friendship sort of blossomed into what could be some real legal jeopardy for a prominent congressman. Yeah, let's take a look at that legal jeopardy now with Shan Wu. So, Shan, take us through what Joel Greenberg, how Joel Greenberg came to the attention of investigators and what he's admitted to and where he might go next with regards to implicating his good friend, Matt Gates. Well, really, uh, <clears throat> Greenberg uh, is really uh, an extraordinary example <clears throat> of um, a vocal... Uh, politician uh, who, as we're just discussing, would normally not be on the radar screen, but he really tremendously abused his position. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable. I mean, he used his access to public records to look for information on rivals. He made a uh, a fake charge uh, that a political rival uh, was engaged in some sort of sexual misconduct, something that current prosecutors, I'm sure, aren't happy about. He has that baggage. Uh, so there was really quite a wide variety of improprieties that he was engaged in, illegal improprieties. And uh, 
that gives the prosecutors a lot of leverage <clears throat> on him because they can plea bargain with him. And in return for his cooperation on other things, perhaps a public official like Gates, uh, they'll cut him a deal. And you notice that he early on signaled that. I mean, when he was when it first became public, uh, right away his lawyer was saying that Gates should be worried about that. So they were uh, waving a very loud flag that they wanted to cooperate, probably to get a better deal for him. And so potentially for Gates, and you know these are allegations, of course, but potentially for Gates, this is a very dangerous uh, witness. It's somebody uh, who is close to him who. In his own plea agreement, Greenberg admitted um, to the sexual uh, illegal acts uh, mm. with the procuring of women, including a 17-year-old, and mentions that there were other men who had engaged in, quote, commercial um, sex with these women, although you know Gates himself, of course, is not named, but, but nobody is named, uh, which is appropriate right. because they shouldn't name people until they're going to bring right. charges. So that's, that, that's the mystery here. Who are these other men? And when will Joel Greenberg reveal who they are? Um, let's just hear from Matt Gates for a second. He denies any wrongdoing. His office issued this statement after Joel Greenberg's plea deal. Congressman Gates doesn't seem to be named nor referenced in Mr. Greenberg's plea. Congressman Gates has never had sex with a minor and has never paid for sex. Mr. Greenberg has now pled guilty to falsely accusing someone else of sex with a minor. That person was innocent. So is Congressman Gates. So Matt Gates then has good reason uh, to run down Mr. Greenberg's uh, plea deal potentially. Oh, absolutely, and that's a standard operating procedure for if you are defending a client who's being uh, accused, and the government's using a cooperating witness then the defense counsel always attacks the cooperating mm. witnesses' cooperation agreement, which is you basically have motivation to lie, to fabricate for the government because you're getting a good deal. So, so that standard happens every day in courtrooms around the country, and right. uh, Greenberg carries that baggage. Uh, he does carry a little extra baggage because he specifically had made a false sexual accusation. Um, however, it's not as though the prosecutors uh, or a jury, if it gets to that stage, have to go just you know, on Greenberg being a good Boy Scout. Uh, they're going to have other evidence that would have to corroborate that. There'll be financial records, documents yes. of payments made. Uh, apparently, they're using cash apps in, in this instance, so that's all documented. Uh, travel records. And then, very importantly, besides Greenberg, uh, there's no question they would be reaching out to the women involved, um, and if they find and contact the underage minor, then that's a very devastating situation uh, for Gates uh, because there's no defense, there's no legal defense to that. You can't claim that oh, I, I thought that they were older. I mean, it's a strict liability issue. If they're underage, they're underage. Right. So there'll be other witnesses besides. Greenberg. Well, I mean, ex-girlfriend of Matt Gates, uh, the most recent person to come forward. Apparently, uh, she was a former Capitol Hill employee, and she's agreed to cooperate with federal investigators. Why might she be important here? Uh, similar to Greenberg's right, uh, baggage, which is uh, she's not at, at the moment being charged with anything. Uh, importantly, the reports of her knowledge seem to focus on the year 2017, which is the year in question where he is alleged to have uh, had the contact with the minor child. And so if she's able to corroborate either the fact that he had been in the same place with them right. or if she witnessed anything like that, uh, then that would be very damaging uh, as well. You know, I, I would note it's interesting that Although the most salacious parts of this case, you know, are the sex crimes aspect, trafficking and the underage sex, the investigation is being run out of the public corruption uh, section of the Justice Department called public integrity. These guys aren't sex crimes prosecutors. They're very different kinds of crimes. And the fact that they're looking at it uh, indicates that they're probably having their eye on uh, something mm -hmm. broader than just the sex crime. So that's an interesting aspect to look at. What else are they developing here? Is there, yep. you know, corruption in terms of, you know, doing something for lobbyists, bribery, uh, you know, is there obstruction of justice? They're, they're going to be looking at something other than just the sex crimes themselves. Uh, Matt, some on the right of the Republican Party have said that the Democrats are just going after Matt Gates uh, because it's all political. Uh, they want to get their revenge on him now that they have the, the upper hand. They're in the White House and dominating the, uh, the, the lower house and so on. 
Um, but in fact, this, this whole investigation into Matt Gates began under Bill Barr, the Attorney General who was appointed by President Trump. Yeah, I mean, at, at any time uh, there, there's going to be an investigation of this, like a, a, into a sitting congressman, it's going to at least get task approval from you know the, the top level of government. In this case, it was during the Trump administration and Bill Barr. And yeah, there was reporting after um, Bill Barr had had some cognizance of what the allegations were that that yeah he wanted to distance himself from from the congressman in public settings and, and things like that. There was uh, definitely that that is what our reporting indicates, and uh, he, he never addressed it publicly at the time. But that's sort of where the the starting line for all of this was, and then uh, an instinct by by Bill Barr to sort of distance. Okay, we're going to leave it there for a moment. Let's turn to our second story now: the two prison guards who are supposed to be keeping an eye on Jeffrey Epstein on the day he killed himself in his cell, uh, pleaded guilty to falsifying prison records related to their work. Tova Noel and Michael Thomas were suspected of sleeping and shopping online while Epstein hanged himself using his bedsheets. That was August the 10th, 2019. He was due to go on trial on sex trafficking charges. The billionaire faced spending the rest of his life behind bars if found guilty. Noel and Thomas struck a plea deal, allowing them to avoid jail by agreeing to perform community service and cooperate with a government inquiry. Where are the supervisors? Where are the people who made the policy decisions? Why didn't Mr. Epstein have a cellmate at the time that this happened? These are all things that are very important, but we don't have answers. All we have is a rush to judgment, a rush to charge the smallest, the people who are getting paid the least, and sent, make those people pay for the problems and the things that didn't happen throughout an entire system. Matt, of course, we know that uh, Jeffrey Epstein had a big presence in Florida. Uh, the Miami Herald went after him and so on. I mean, Florida was really, along with New York, his base. Uh, what was the reaction to these guards, uh, the, the plea deal that they managed to secure for themselves? Well, I mean, I, I think like everywhere else, there is certainly a, a bit of surprise. And it, it is important to note, um, you know, New, New York got a lot of attention. But, I mean, the Miami Herald's uh, really good work over several years is, is, is yeah. really why we are here today. So I, I, I think there was certainly a, certainly a level of interest here, uh, you know, because of that. And, you know, the, the, the plea deal, like everywhere else in the country, I think the reaction was, you know, rel relatively the same as, uh, you know, sort of, sort of surprise, I guess. As a former prosecutor, Shan... Um... You know, you can well understand how disappointed uh, the prosecutors were in New York uh, to, to, to see what happened with Jeffrey Epstein. Um, are they going to be satisfied with what happened with the guards? Or they, would they want to see something deeper, a deeper investigation into what happened? Well, it sounds like there is still an ongoing investigation, and uh, the defense lawyers may be right. They may be low-hanging fruit, and perhaps they can give up further information about deeper systemic issues, or even if anyone higher up has failed in their duty. I mean, for me, as a former DOJ official, I mean, Matt's point about the Miami Herald breaking or kind of reviving this whole Epstein story and the great coverage they, they did, I mean, to me, that's the real point here is I hope, and we can relate this a little bit, you know, to what's happening with Congressman Gates, you know, I hope DOJ has learned its lesson from the debacle they had with Epstein the first time around, uh, that they really sold those victims down the river by cutting that deal with them. And uh, it really is the reporting that brought this all to light again and forced them to reconsider what they did with yeah. Epstein. You know, and, and then tragically, you know, Epstein was a convicted felon, but, you know, people are supposed to, in the United States, protect the prison population. And tragically, there's a complete failure. Well, Shan Wu and Matt Dixon, thank you both so much for your contributions to the Nexus today. Much appreciated. Well, let's focus a bit more on the circumstances surrounding the death of Jeffrey Epstein now. The official coroner ruled it a suicide, but there are a number of others who doubt that explanation, including our next guest, Dr. Cyril Wecht, a forensic pathologist with 60 years' experience. Dr. Wecht, welcome to the programme. As someone Thank who's you, been man. involved with prisons and prison reform for a very long time, what did you make of the court case involving the two guards? I think this is a, a cop-out situation for everybody. I believe that they decided not to proceed with disciplinary action, suspension, or termination of the guards' employment because uh, their attorneys would have fought this and they would have gotten into details and had to have discussed the entire situation 
the environment in which Jeffrey Epstein was found dead. So this is one of those deals where they everybody walks away and there's no further discussion uh -huh. for public uh, disclosure. And uh, these two guys walk away 100 hours of community service, like some kind of minor drug offense, and will never learn why, uh, just 15 feet away, as they sat from the prison cell uh, of Epstein, that they failed to notice anything, why they failed uh, to check on him every 30 minutes, as they were supposed to do. We'll never know that. Now, so everything continues to be covered up. You're clearly not satisfied with the outcome. What would you have liked to have seen happen? What I would have liked to have seen happen was, and not uh, because I want to be uh, harsh on these guards, but I would have liked to have heard their explanation. How is it that you failed to do your job? You knew uh, the person you were dealing with. You knew the importance of uh, this individual. Uh, your prison had housed uh, some major figures, uh, Chaparral and Gotti, John Gotti, the mafia king uh, here at your prison. This isn't some cockamamie uh, two-cell a prison in uh, West Overshoe, uh, Wyoming. This is a major prison. How come you did not do this? How come the camera was not working in the cell? How come the camera wasn't working outside the cell? How come all of this was not handled in, in the most basic and simplistic of fashion? That's what I would like to have seen. Dr. Wecht, uh, clearly you're extremely suspicious about what happened, as are a lot of people. Do you have any personal feeling, inclination about why this was so incompetently handled? Yes, I do. I think it's part of the entire uh, sham operation. Uh, who's in ultimate control? I don't know. And it isn't like one person is sitting up there uh, controlling strings onto puppets. The word goes on, the message goes out, many people become involved, and then it's a follow-up as we have seen with other matters of great importance, like in this country with the JFK mm. and RFK and MLK assassinations. This so that's what I believe. I uh, believe that it's a cover-up, and uh, that's why Epstein was never going to be allowed to live and come in to testify. You're talking about a case that involves a prince in your country, a former president in our country, former governor, a U.S. senator, major figures, uh, high-level financiers. You're talking about serious matters. Yes. Uh, yes. And there's no way in which this was going to be allowed to be presented in an open forum uh, with interrogation and cross-examination of various witnesses by skilled attorneys. What's it going to take to, to break this conspiracy of silence? The only thing that remains as a possibility is the trial of Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, that's scheduled to take place later this year. And uh, so far, they've kept her alive. Um, let us see what happens. She can't work out, uh, it seems to me, any kind of a plea bargain at her age. Um, so what difference does it make if it's a 40-year sentence yeah. or a 20-year sentence? She's not likely to survive. So let us see. And, I, and, I, and, I'm sure they're going to find a way to cover it up, but we'll see. Wow. That, that's an extraordinary um, prediction from a, a man with 60 years' experience. Do you think that she's going to make it to trial? <laughs> I think it would be... Um, too heavy a load for them to cover up if she somehow uh, inadvertently died or accidentally died or was murdered by another <clears throat> inmate. So uh, if she comes to trial, what possible uh, arrangement could have been made? I don't know. Um, as they say, she's not a youngster. To go to jail for 10 or more years sure. is maybe, you know, the end of her life. So let's see what and happens. And a final question for you. Uh, you mentioned Glenn Maxwell. Uh, obviously, they're going to do... Netflix and James Patterson are going to do another docu-series about her this time called Chasing Ghislaine. You were in the first one, uh, Filthy Rich. Can I ask, does any new information actually come to light? Is there any purpose and decent outcome from these docu-series? Well, um, Ghislaine Maxwell... Um, I don't think we'll know anything about the actual physical events in Jeffrey Epstein's prison cell that day. She can't shed light on that. But uh, by giving further background about the people involved, then if the authorities uh, really are serious about this and they conduct a kind of investigation that should have been undertaken uh, following his death, um, asking people uh, and checking with every guard 
such as should have been done now with these two guards, then maybe uh, we'll see. I, I, I don't want to be naive and uh, to be painfully, um, yeah. but realistically pessimistic. I think somehow or another they'll finesse the whole thing. And the answer to your question is, I think, and it hurts me to say this, that we probably will never know the answer of the truth behind Jeffrey Epstein's death. That's a terrible prospect, but uh, with your level of experience, Dr. Cyril Weck, I don't think anyone's going to accuse you of being naive. Thank you so much for your you. contributions to the program today once again. Thank you. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, if you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do look at our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week, then. Goodbye.